Ah, uh, Times Square. The only place where you can see a musical about puppets having sex, and then walk outside to also see puppets having sex. Beloved by tourists and be hated by locals, Times Square is one of the most visited places in the world, which is why it's particularly strange that one Times Square, a skyscraper smack in the middle of the Neon Seizure District, is completely empty. The story of one Times Square, and why it's as empty as the mezzanine at Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, is really the story of Times Square itself. After all, Times Square was named for this building. Before the New York Times built its headquarters there in 1904, the area was known as Long Acre Square, after London's Long Acre, as it was the center of New York's horse carriage industry, beginning a long tradition of the square being full of crap. One Times Square is a weirdly shaped building, mostly because it was built on this weirdly shaped plot of land. A trapezoid that exists because Times Square is not a square at all. It's more of a bow tie formed by the intersection of 7th Avenue and Broadway. If you've ever wondered why Manhattan's grid system is interrupted by a weird long curvy road that loves musicals, it's because Broadway existed before the city even did, first as the Wick Quasgig Trail, and eventually growing into the island's primary road when the Dutch bought Manhattan for the price of Jungle Cruise on Blu-ray and named it New Amsterdam. By the time it was New York, and America got around to designing the grid system with the Commissioner's Plan of 1811, they couldn't very well get rid of the most used road, so they built the grid system on top of it, which created a bunch of weird little bow tie shapes, including Times Square. Because apparently getting the whole area named after them wasn't enough, the New York Times decided to drum up publicity by throwing a New Year's Eve party at the new building on December 31st, 1904, and at the end, to celebrate the impending Bloody Sunday Massacre of 1905, they set off fireworks. It was a big success, with 200,000 people coming to watch, so they repeated it the next year, and the next, but then in 1908, Adolph Oakes, owner of the Times, thought, you know what's boring? Giant explosions in the sky. You know what's cool? Slowly dropping a big ball. And so he did that, and people loved it, and to this day, Times Square continues to be the perfect place to go if you want to ring in the new year by peeing on the street near a giant olive garden. The same year the New York Times moved in, Times Square saw its first electrified advertisements, and in the post-World War I era, as Times Square gained hotels and theaters and became a hub for subway and bus lines, people covered more and more of these big businesses with big signs telling them to go to other big businesses, making Times Square ads an $85 million industry by the end of the 1920s. The New York Times moved its headquarters a block over in 1913, but continued to own one Times Square, and in 1928 they installed the Zipper, a giant news ticker that ran around the building using 14,800 light bulbs and a chain conveyor system to tell the unwashed masses that someone finally invented penicillin. But during the Great Depression, New York discovered that an 8 million watt monument to American excess may not have been the flawless city planning win they thought. The upscale hotels and theaters struggled to stay open, and were replaced with far less upscale grinder houses, burlesque theaters, and peep shows. Still though, lit up ads were a staple. The iconic Camel Cigarette sign was installed in 1940, and Times Square remained a popular gathering place. Famously in 1945, the zipper on one Times Square announced Japan's surrender in World War II to a massive crowd, which is where we get this picture celebrating the end of the war with some vintage sexual assault. Throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Times Square continued to gain sex shops and go-go bars, seeing significant increases in solicitation, crime, Martin Scorsese movies, and articles describing it as seedy. In 1961, the New York Times sold one Times Square, and was passed between various investors, generally used as office space, while the famed zipper was intermittently run by various news outlets. So why did Times Square turn from an S&M hotspot to an M&M hotspot? Well, the same reason America's entire copyright system is broken. Disney. In 1993, the city of New York convinced Disney to take control of and renovate the historic New Amsterdam Theater, which wasn't an easy sell as Disney is mostly known for Mickey Mouse, and Times Square, at the time, was mostly known for Dickie Houses, which is what I call sex shops. Disney would only sign the contract once the city agreed to evict pornographic theaters and replace them with an AMC, and to evict peep shows and replace them with a Madame Tussauds, which, to be fair, is basically a peep show where instead of seeing naked people, you see a slightly off-putting statue of Jeff Goldblum. Getting the Disney brand attached signaled to companies like Warner Brothers, MTV, Reuters, and McDonald's that Times Square was now sufficiently lame and boring enough not to harm their brands, essentially creating the modern Times Square. Only two years after the Disney deal, Lehman Brothers bought one Times Square and had a revelation. With Times Square on the rise, the building's exterior advertising space was worth more than the interior office space, especially considering that its odd shape meant it doesn't have a lot of square footage, but it does have a lot of exterior. So they kept it empty, covered it with billboards, and by 1995, one Times Square was bringing in $7 million a year, a 300% profit increase. 
Since then, it's been home to a number of iconic signs, including the Cup Noodle and the Panasonic Jumbotron, but in 2019, the multi-ad system was abandoned for one giant electronic screen on the main facade, which, in conjunction with the two at the top, all simultaneously show ads for the same things. During this period, the bottom floor has had various uses. There was a Warner Brothers store, a JCPenney, and most recently, a Walgreens. Although, perhaps because of announced plans to put a museum and observation deck between the 15th and 18th floors, the Walgreens is currently completely empty, save for one security guard who was very annoyed with us for filming this video. You know what else we filmed? A real-life cross-country crime-breaking game show called Half as Interesting's Crime Spree. The rules are simple. My writers found the 34 weirdest laws in America, put them on a map, and gave me $5,000 and 72 hours to travel around the country and break eight of them. But my writers got $3,000 and a live tracker on me, and if they tagged me, I lost a point. The first episode came out today, and I really hope you'll check it out. At the risk of destroying HII's cool, detached, bad boy vibe, I'll tell you that we worked really hard on it, and we're really proud of it. Now, obviously, the only people insane enough to fund this were the good people at Nebula, the creator-owned streaming site I helped start with all my creator friends. The best way to get Nebula is with the Nebula Curiosity Stream Bundle, which is less than $15 for a whole year right now, which also gives you access to Curiosity Stream, which just so happens to have just released Wendover Productions' first feature length documentary, The Colorado Problem, A River in the Red. So click the button on screen or head to curiositystream.com slash HAI to get the bundle deal and watch our show, or forever live in regret.